Hi there, this is Covenant's class for Growth Track. This is session number three. Uh, my name is Heath Hyatt, and if you would like college credit for this, you can go to churchoftheheartland.com and click on Growth Track, and right there it's got all the information. You can hit Covenant's with God, and it'll have the test and how you pay and all that kind of stuff right there. If you'd like to email me, you can get a hold of me at pastorhyatt at gmail.com, P-A-S-T-O-R-H-I-A-T-T at gmail.com. All right, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus... Give us ears to hear and hearts that are open for your word to be planted deep inside of us. Lord, as we continue to study covenants, we continue to dive into your word. Lord, make it illuminate it, make it come alive to us because you are the living word and we want to know you today in Jesus name. Amen. So I'd like to start out here talking about the Mosaic covenant. Okay, Moses, the covenant of Moses. This is a big one. This is a real big one. The Jewish people still believe that this is the one that they're under today. And we're going to see that that's not the case. Uh, we Christians believe uh, that it was a, a placeholder. Actually, let's talk about that. Um, to the Jews, they would believe that the Mosaic Covenant is, this is the relationship with God. This is how they know God. And we're, we're going to look at the New Covenant as how we actually know God. But it's like a placeholder. Okay, you ever had like a, a situation that you had to kind of throw it together? I remember I was in Bulgaria on a mission trip years ago and we were stuck on the side of the road and we didn't know what to do. And there was an old farmhouse guy and the farm guy comes out there and and we had broken some kind of a hose or something and we were leaking antifreeze or water or something. And and I don't know much about those things, but I know one thing. You don't usually use garden hose, but that's what they did. They cut a piece of garden hose and cut another piece of garden hose and attached it here and attached it there. And so in the middle of that car was the big piece of green garden hose and they kind of strapped it together. And of course, that is not a permanent fix when you garden hose your car together. That would be a placeholder, right? That's just enough to get you to where you're going so that you can get the actual thing fixed right. That is how the Mosaic Covenant is compared to the New Covenant. It's a placeholder. It's not, it's not the real thing. It's just, it was just to get them down the road so that they could have Christ come. It was really built on the idea of people didn't know what God expected of them. Up until this time, God had never really laid out what was expected. You know, all relationships have to come to that place, right? Where you, where you say what's expected of, of you, you know? And, and, uh, Usually it's not early on in the relationship, but somewhere along it is like, okay, so I'm going to mow the lawn and you're going to do the laundry and I'm going to uh, do the dishes and you're going to do the fit cooking of the food. This is, by the way, exactly what Missy and I do. I, what I just laid out for you is not, for instance, it's exactly. So, but that's, you've you got to have this discussion. What, what does it take to have this relationship go? Now, it shouldn't be only about those things. I'm not in uh, my marriage because I do things for her and she does things for me. It's way beyond that. I love her. I give my life for her. It's not about those things, but those things are part of it. And if I straight up didn't do any of them, it's not going to go over well, (laughs) right? So that's that's the idea. God, God lays out what it means, what he's expected, what's expected from both sides. I'll do this, you do that. Remember, that's what covenants have. So he lays out this Mosaic Covenant through Moses. Um, the Mosaic Covenant is also sometimes called the Sinai Covenant because it was given on Mount, Mount Sinai. Um, it didn't replace the Abrahamic Covenant. Now, if you remember, we just studied the Abrahamic Covenant in the last session. The Abra- it's forever that the children of Israel, the Israelites would have that place and that God would bless the people and he would put his hand of blessing on them and God would have one family and he'd be working through that family. It doesn't replace it. It, it, it adds to it. The Ab- Abrahamic covenant is everlasting. It's irrevocable. The, the Mosaic covenant is temporary until Jesus comes. And that's why Jesus came and he said, I have come to fulfill the law. I've come to put the right hose on, not the garden hose. I've come to fix this, not with zip ties and duct tape. I've come to fix it permanently to actually fix it that's why it's so important that we um that we let go of all the works based stuff and get into the relationship based stuff because that was just a placeholder to get to the real relationship back to our marriage illustration are am i am i married because i do those things and she does those things no wouldn't it be better 
instead of even having the laid out expectations, that it's I'm not just doing my 50%, I'm doing 100%. I'm doing it all for her and she's doing 100%. Why? Because we love each other and from that love and relationship comes the, the actions. That's, that's what's happening in this new covenant versus the Mosaic covenant, the Sinai covenant. Now the Mosaic covenant was to show Israel how sinful they were. You know, they're like, we're doing good. No, you're not doing good. We're fine, aren't we? No, you guys are making a lot of mistakes. And so he lays out, God lays out all the ways that they were, that they were sinning. We're going to go to Leviticus chapter 26 now. We're going to see the uh, part, at least, of the Mosaic Covenant. And uh, we're going to start Leviticus 26. We're going to start in verse 1. Do not, do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone for yourselves. And do not place a carved stone in your land to bow down before it. I am the Lord your God. Okay, no other idols, no other stuff. You're going to worship me. You've got to stop with the idol worship. You know, the thing about idols, and we think that's uh, so dumb that those ancient cultures had idols. What was the deal with idol worship? Well, people love something they can grab a hold of. Something tangible. They almost always take something tangible over something that they, that, that's not touchable. And they love the idea of having an idol. And, and the idol, by the way, always, all the different gods of the Canaanites and all those, even the multi-theistic uh, god stuff, they all did different things for you. This one would help you with getting reproductive. You know, you can get your, uh, you can have babies with this one. And so you want to, if you want to get babies, you go to this one. And if you want money, you go to this one. And if you want your crops to go, to go well, you go to this one who gives rain. And if you want to make sure you make it to the afterlife, you go to this one. It's always based on something tangible. And God's like, no, it's not about these things. God is spirit. God is, it's a spiritual thing that's happening. And he said, yes, there's, there's, there's natural things. Those are like the, the echo of the actual thing. That's not the thing. That's an echo of the thing. But we as humans, we love to grab a hold of something that we feel we can, we can really get. And God's saying, no, no, no. Get the relationship. Get the heart. Get the soul right. And all these other things. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. And we love to make it about the things we can touch. That's why God really, really detested idol worship. Because it was the opposite of what he's trying to accomplish. So that's verse 1. Okay, I guess I, I got more verses to go through here. Okay, verse 2, Leviticus 26. Observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Okay, one day a week, we stop, we, we worship God. We revere the Lord. We go to his sanctuary. This is how we do it. Now, Jewish, I've been to Israel now many times. I think it's five. And the Jewish people, they don't, we have an American culture. We have five days we work, weekdays, and we have two weekends, right? We have Saturday and Sunday. Saturday is made for whatever, doing whatever. And then Sunday we go to church and kind of chill out with our family. Jewish culture is not like that. It is six on and one off. It's six, they don't, it's not five and two, it's six and one. And the, that one is really off. I mean, really off. I was so stunned by the amount of off that they take, you know, and uh, being that it's, uh, you know, that they take, the Orthodox Jews take their Sabbath so seriously, they don't cook food. They have to, the day before, they would make all the food for the next day. And so um, when you're, when you go to a hotel there uh, in Israel, in Jerusalem, all the food on, on Sabbath, Shabbat, Saturday, um, all those food was prepared the day before, and it's the Muslims usually that are the, 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 the waiters and the waitresses. It's almost a totally different staff because the Jews, they don't, they're not allowed to work. They don't work, and they, they take the time off. And another thing I thought, thought interesting, I always thought the you know, Shabbat service, it's usually Friday night, by the way. When the sun goes down, church starts. And so it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not Saturday morning like we have Sunday morning church. It's really Friday night. And then, and then they, they, they eat together after church and then, uh, or synagogue, and then they chill out on Saturday. Matter of fact, it's so, they take this Sabbath so seriously that when you're in a hotel there, they have, they're called Shabbat elevators, Sabbath elevators. They go up and down every floor because hitting the button, like I want to go to floor number four, that's considered work. 
You can't hit the button. Now, you can walk in the elevator. You get a certain amount of miles you can walk in a, on a Sabbath. That's why they always live as close as they can to the synagogue that they go to because you can only, I don't know what it is, two miles or something like that. You can only go a certain area, you know. So but you can walk in an elevator, but it goes literally every floor and stops and every floor and stops and every floor and stops. So you just got to like, if you're on 18, you're going to stop and it opens up and it closes. But, you know, you can't hit 18. And if you make the mistake like I have a few times and you're just you wanted to get in the uh, non-Jewish elevators and hit the button and you accidentally got on the Shabbat elevator, you are going to be on that a long time <laughs> because you're on for the long ride. You're on for the ride as if everybody went, here's the buttons. <laughs> kind of like the Elf movie. Anyway, why am I telling you that? I don't know. How, how they take Sabbath and they make it so very, they take it so very seriously. I'm glad they do, by the way. I'm glad they do. I think we should take it more seriously in, in America as well. Take that time off and really take some time off. Though I don't believe it has to be Friday night and Saturday and such, um, like the Sabbath keeping uh, Advent, Seventh-day Adventists, etc. But I do think it'd be best if all of us just said, you know, I'm going to do very, very little. I'm going to do very, very little. I'm going to stop. Let's be bored a little bit. I don't think it hurt us to be bored a little bit. Let's stop and be bored a little bit. Put the phone, turn it off, and just be with your own thoughts. There's nothing wrong with that. So some clarity that comes from that. Verse 3. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands... I will send you rain in its season and the ground will yield its crops and the trees their fruit. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest and the grape harvest will continue until planting and you will eat all the food you want and live in safety in the land. Okay, you see a lot of similarities between this Mosaic covenant and all the earlier covenants. Um, We have the strong power laying this out to the weak power. Here's what I'm giving you. If you do these things, I'll give you these things. If you don't do these things, especially we get this from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Here's the blessings. Here's the repercussions. Here's what happens if you disobey me. Here's how it's laid out. It was a conditional covenant. It differs significantly from the Abrahamic covenant and the later biblical covenants because it's conditional in all the blessings. You know, the Abrahamic one was unconditional. I'm just, I'm doing this for you. I'm going to, your, your, your children, no matter what you do, Abram, I'm going to, your children are going to, this is the blessing that's going to be on them. And this one's like, no, there's some stuff you got to be doing here. If Israel's obedient, God's going to bless them. Disobedient, not going to be blessed. And in this covenant, God promises to make Israel a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's Exodus 19.6. This Mosaic law was, was to show people their sinfulness. That's why it's important to have like, even, even when we're talking in a modern evangelical situation, people need to know they're sinners. I think one of the biggest problems that we have with, uh, with modern philosophy or theology is you don't, you don't need a savior because you're not a sinner. You know, so we say, All right, has Jesus saved you from your sins? Well, I think everything I'm doing is fine. I'm munching a smorgasbord of tree of knowledge of good and evil. I'm just deliver. I'm eating all I want from this. I can decide what I want, what's right and what's wrong for myself. I don't need a savior because I'm not a sinner. And we go back to the Ten Commandments. And we start rolling through those bad boys and we realize, hey, come on. Have you really never stolen anything? Really? <coughs> you really never taken anything that wasn't yours? At your workplace, you didn't take that pencil? Really? No, we're, we're broken, sinful people in need of a Savior. And until we realize that, we'll, we'll never really break through into people's hearts and minds. Because we're, we all, we're all broken and sinful. Man, I'm broken and sinful. You're broken and sinful. We are in need of a Savior. That modern humanism is not good. It says, we're great. Everything we do is great. Every thought you have that rolls through your, throws through your head is great. Every philosophy you dream up is great. It's great because you came up with it because you're great. That's not true. There are some thoughts better than other thoughts. There are some philosophies better than other philosophies. There are some ways of thinking better than other ways of thinking. There are some things that are sin. Harmatia in the Greek. Off, they're off, it's off the harmatia, the, the bullseye. There's things off the bullseye of our life. This, this is where God wants us to be. This is where God wants us to live. And anything that's not 
right there, hamartia. Anything that's not right in the bullseye is, is, a, is, some, is sin for, for us. Even for me, I, I have things that I know the Lord is telling me not to do. The Lord's got different things that he shares with me. This is like, and, and it might not even be sin for somebody else. I don't know. But I know for me, that's something I need to stay away from. It's something I need to let go of because that's not the bullseye that God's got for my life. And I cannot get to where God wants me to be until I hit that bullseye by only through Christ himself. Okay, so it's the Mosaic law that Christ himself said he didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. And notice you have a lot of animal sacrifices in this Mosaic law. Lots of animals die, and you kill this animal for that, you kill that animal for this, and you, you, there's a sacrifice of a goat for this and a sheep for that. All of that is foreshadowing of our Savior, the Lamb of God that was slain for the salvation of the world. All of that is just a garden hose put together to, to, to get us get, get them along until the Savior, the Savior had come. You know, the, this, this idea of Christ uh, taking away our sin, the Mosaic Covenant actually did not take away sin. The Mosaic Covenant, all it did was cover it up. Just like our illustration about the garden hose. It didn't really solve the problem, it just covered it up. It's like when you wanted to clean your room, or your mom said to clean your room, and all you did was throw everything under the bed or in the closet. You know, it's like, it's not, and the mom goes up there and goes, well, it looks cleaner. Yeah, it's not actually cleaner. You just took the mess, instead of being everywhere, the mess is really, really, uh, you know, holed up in a couple of different places. That's the idea. The sin is maybe not as visible, but it was not dealt with. Only in Christ was the sin completely washed away and completely dealt with. The Mosaic Covenant itself, with all those detailed laws, it could not save people. It does not save people. Only in Christ is a real salvation of our sins. That's why we pray for the Jewish people to realize the Savior that's come for them. And to study the Word of God and see. I mean, I love, I have many Jewish friends. I pray for, I pray for them to come to the realization of their need for Jesus. Because they're, they're, in a, they're, just, they're working on a, in a car with a lot of duct tape and a lot of zip ties. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, the Abrahamic covenant was to be fulfilled by the new covenant and the Mosaic covenant was abolished by, by Jesus. So, I mean, it was totally removed, totally gone. And um, all those complex requirements, all those things, all those requirements are gone. The book of Acts, those first apostles laid out two things for the Gentiles. It said, no eating animals that were sacrificed to satan to, to, to other gods and no sexual perversion those were the two things that were laid out now it's interesting even and how paul later says i don't even mind eating the sacrifice to animals that were sacrificed to these other gods as long as i didn't know they were sacrificed it doesn't even bother me because i was like it's just delicious that's all i know is it's delicious now personally i think it would be weird if i went to the satanic high priest and bought my beef from them or something like that. I think that's a little weird. I probably have a little problem with that. I'm not sure I'd enjoy that steak knowing that it was sacrificed. But let's say if we'll say I didn't know, I might enjoy that porterhouse. <laughs> I don't know how that works. But I noticed, notice the other, the other thing given to the Gentiles in the book of Acts. The sexual purity. It seems like, man, especially in today's society, Everything revolves around that. People's identities, who they are, what they want to do, how much they want to do it, who they want to do it with. It's, it's become, it's not, I mean, it's not just a, a small thing, it's a big thing. It's become this huge situation, uh, you know, sexual things, it's a freedom and liberty, and it's all that, that they feel it's tied into that. That's nothing but slavery. Nothing but slavery. People aren't free. <laughs> They're not free because they can't stop. You know, you always know when someone's not free when they can't stop. And they can't stop. They love the sin. They want it. They want more and more of it. But you notice that, that there's something tied in there with, the, with the, all the sexual perversion. There's something tied in there to our souls and our spirits. The enemy works in that direction so much, we've got to realize there's got to be something more there than just... Uh, body parts and procreation. 
By the way, if you're catching me, I'm, I'm using my words very carefully. Because we've got to talk about this, but you know, how we talk about this is important. You've got to make sure we cut it right. But, but you know, I, I, do, I just think there's something going on there. That, there, that, that purity's got to be restored to, to, to the Christians, to all of us. We've got to really push for that in our own hearts. We've got to strive for that. There's a lot of things, commercials and different stuff that can just take us off in all kinds of different directions. And we have got to stay laser focused on the things that God's called us to do and not be, um, not be derailed by all of that sexual perversion that we see in our culture right now. And our poor kids who have to be grow, grow up in this situation. It's unbelievable. I like what my wife says. She's like, I want it all back in the closet. I, I think that's a good way to do it. Not just any kind of uh, sexual perversion stuff. Uh, she wants it all in the closet. All you heteros, you're in the closet too. I don't want to hear about what you're doing. Oh, everybody else, everybody's in the closet. Can we, not, can we just not talk about that stuff? Can we not make that this thing that's pr- pushed upon children who don't even understand what this is about? I know I didn't. Couldn't imagine someone having to talk to me about that kind of stuff. Please don't tear the innocence out of our, our next generation? Let's not do that. Okay, that was my little soapbox right there. But notice the only thing left from the Mosaic Covenant the, in the, to the Gentiles, the book of Acts, was that, was that angle about making sure that our, our, uh, our sexual life was, was what it needed to be. Now, when you look at the Mosaic Covenant, it's got all kinds of, you know, there's all kinds of rules for everything. I mean, it's can't even barely keep track of all the rules. I think it's over 600 when the Hebrews write it out, how many things you got to do and not do and this and that. I, one thing I find interesting about it though, God was asking these people to trust him. So he would write down there, if you've got some kind of fungus in your house, you need to go to the high priest and you, you try. God was even caring about how they were living together as a society. He even talks about, that's, once again, it's kind of crass, you know, how you go to the bathroom. You do it outside the tent, outside the camp, please. You know, not, we don't do that around here. Because he didn't want to explain to this ancient culture, bacterias, there's, a, there's a something so small that you can never ever see it with any technology that's not going to be invented for 2,000 years. You know, he, he just said, you just need to trust me. <laughs> there's viruses and bacteria, just trust me, this is how you need to go about things. And I love that that now with modern science we find out well that's why god said to do that well of course that makes more sense we shouldn't eat shellfish because if you don't cook it right it's going to kill you but god didn't want to have to explain bacteria and all that da, 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 da. just don't eat it but once again we see the goodness of god actually even interwoven into the mosaic covenant he was just saying stop overthinking it stop with the knowledge of good and evil trust me Stand on my word, do as I say, and it works out good for you. That's what the Mosaic Covenant's about. Now, the next one is one that I'm going through, I'm doing seven of them. This is, if you do six, this would be the one that would not be in there. Some people say it's part of the Mosaic Covenant. I am doing it as a separate one. Take your choice. It's called the Land Covenant, or sometimes called the Palestinian Covenant. It's about the land. Now, this covenant takes place, the other one was done on Sinai, done on Mount Sinai. This one takes place in a separate uh, location in the plains of Moab and with the second generation. So, it's, so that's why some people have it, and I, I'm having it as a separate uh, covenant beside the, the Mosaic covenant. But some have it as the same. And the idea here is that, um, well, let's actually do this. Let's do it together. De- Deuteronomy chapter 30, 1 through 10. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Uh, verses 1 through 10. We're going to see here what, what God was laying out before his people. Remember, that's how, that's how uh, covenants are, right? They're laid out from a strong power to a weak power with repercussions, usually the shedding of blood. Sometimes there's conditions. You know, that's, that's what we're about to see here. And God's about to lay this out. Uh, no negotiating, right? God's about to lay this out to his people. Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. When all these things, all these blessings and cursings I've set before you come on you, And you take them to heart wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations. Okay, in other words, you're going to be be spread out. Remember Abraham said there's going to be a bunch of you guys. You're going to be spread out around the world. And they are and were. And when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I command you today, when you obey God, notice verse three, then, watch, see those stipulations. 
Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land out of the heavens, Indiana, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you, verse 5, to the land that belonged to your ancestors. And you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than are your ancestors. This is such a beautiful idea here. Because they're all coming back. And even now, we see all the, the Jewish people coming back and returning to, to, to the Lord. Notice verse 6. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and your hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. A prophetic, uh, right there in, the, in this Moses is writing about the new covenant that's going to come through Jesus. Verse 7, the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies who hate and persecute you. You will again obey the Lord and follow all his commands I'm giving you today. Then the Lord your God will make you most prosperous in all the works of your hands and the fruit of your womb. Now skipping to verse 10, if you obey the Lord your God and keep his commands and decrees that are written in the book of the law and turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. This is what happens. The word land here is used 180 times in the book of Deuteronomy showing that if you obey God, all this land will be your inheritance. Uh, when Israel obeyed, God promised this early and latter rains. That's the sign. Remember we talked about the ring being the sign, the rainbow being the sign. The early and latter rains will be a sign that God has given you this land. So there's two, there was two kind of harvest seasons there in Israel. And it's amazing, like we talked about being in Israel, uh, even now people from all over the world are coming to, to this great nation even again. You know, the Holocaust killed off half the world's Jews in the 30s and 40s, half. And yet this promise, this faithfulness of God, we see still happening. They came in 1948, there became a nation, the, the nation of Israel, it's an absolute miracle. The United Nations voted to create the nation of Israel and it's still there to this day. Israel became a nation even after all that they went through because God's faithfulness here in the land covenant shows the shows that he does not stop. He does not, he, what he says he's going to do, he does. It's a miracle that there's a nation. It's just an absolute miracle. But it shows all of us that we can put our faith in God. Whatever he's promised you, he will do. Keep your feet firmly planted on his faithfulness. All right, let's take a break. <laughs> 